Very excited to be joined by the legendary Tamika Catchings, who has been calling games throughout this NCAA tournament, intimately uh, in the SEC world as well, and we'll get to as much of the many other things she has done in basketball throughout her career if we have the time, but this tournament might very well take up all of that time for us, Tamika, because it has been exciting already. You were able to call... Notre Dame's first couple of performances in this tournament. They take on Oregon State, a team that we've seen defensively locked down throughout the season. But a name that I actually was thinking we did not get to when we did our preview of this tournament, going all these standout players, somehow we missed Hannah Hidalgo. And so I'm, I'm actually excited that we now have the chance to correct that mistake. Tell us about the freshman, getting to see her up close, and where you feel like this Notre Dame team is. Maybe, honestly, not getting as much attention and hype, despite being a two-seed, despite being a team with all this pedigree as some of the other uh, squads throughout this field. How did Hidalgo look? How does this team feel to you right now? Man, um, Coach Ivy and her staff have had this team rocking. And, you know, it, it was cool for me. I, my first opportunity being with an ACC team, spending that time with them. And I had Saturday, Monday games, so I got to call the first round and the second round. But one thing that you will love in watching this game, watching this team play, is the, three, the three-headed monster. But Hannah is definitely the head of the monster. I mean, she is – unbelievable and you'll hear the coaches talk about her you, you talk about what she does defensively you, you talk about what she does offensively but honestly when you watch her in person she's electric elect, elect, electric her personality is you know like welcoming when she gets on on the court she definitely tenacious uh, ferocious oh, i can use all of those words but you wrap all of that into <laughs> She makes the play and then she smiles and it's like, oh, look at little, like look at Hannah, you know. But defensively, I mean, she's all over yeah. the place. She's leading the league and st- leading the NCAA in steals per game, averaging four point six steals per game. Um, just she's everywhere offensively. I mean, to be as little as she is and to control the pace of the game, I said she's the head of the monster because she really does control the pace point guard. She can play the one, the two, um, they bring in, you know, multiple players. However, they are limited in numbers. And that's something that we all continue to talk about. But, you know, one of the things that you look at all of the teams that are playing right now is you start to shorten your bench anyway. And so limited numbers is one thing, but the numbers that they do have are strong and mighty. Um, and you can't say enough about Hannah Hidalgo, Sonia Citron or Sonia Citron, uh, Maddie Westbeld. I mean, different players have stepped up at big time. They've had to face injuries, as every team has had to face injuries. But how you overcome from them, and they, Coach Ivy, done a great job with her staff of just getting them prepared. Yeah, you look at UConn basically down to a six player rotation <laughs> in a similar situation, and you see. Obviously, LSU has had some some absences and some departures and the injury scare in the SEC tournament. There there are a lot of groups dealing with that this time of year, but it's impressive to me always when a freshman is able to, because you look at Citrone and, and Westbelt in that group and they're juniors, whereas Hidalgo to come in and earn the trust of her teammates and, you know, that, that doesn't I think there's a lot of situations where that doesn't go so smoothly. So that's been a standout thing to me to kind of take on that pressure and and handle it, obviously. Produce yeah. at a high level, win a lot of games, and, and be here in the tournament still keeping uh, all of that up. But yeah. what we has to happen for Notre freshmen. Dame in, in this? Oh, like yeah. we have a lot of great freshmen, yeah. right? I mean, Maybe we shouldn't be so surprised anymore, right? At, <laughs> yeah, I mean, look at the Sweet 16. And you can go down on almost all of these teams that are playing. And there's a freshman that stands out. But, of course, you know, at the top of that, you got Hannah Hidalgo. You got Juju Watkin, um, Audie Crooks from Iowa State. They're not in the Sweet 16, but her 40-point performance the other day, I mean, phenomenal. These are numbers that they're putting up that, you know, it's like, oh, like that. those are numbers upperclassmen make. 
those aren't necessarily what you're mm-hmm. relying on from a freshman, but for these freshmen to have to go into roles and fill in roles that have, you know, to produce these big minutes for teams and help them win, I mean, that, that's outstanding. All right, when you look at the matchup for Notre Dame, I it is a little bit of a clash, right? It is it is a, a an offensive team that has put up 152 against a, a defense that has held its opponents to 102 in Oregon State in these first couple of rounds. What has to happen for Notre Dame to get over that hump and get to an Elite Eight? I think at this point, honestly, when you look at all of these games, but looking at this game specifically, it's going to come down to who has who wants it more. You know, you got offense, great offense against great defense, and there's going to be loose balls. There's every single possession matters. Offensively, taking care of the ball, getting good shots. Defensively, you know, pressuring the ball, making sure you're back tonight. I mean, both teams come with so much. To the, they come with come to the table with so much and so many expectations on what they're good at. But at this point in time, when you get to the Sweet 16, all of these teams are great. They've all fought through injuries, battles, ups and downs throughout their season. Game one, games lost. Who wants it more? Who's going to dive on the ball for these loose balls? Who's going to be the player that steps up? It might not be your star players that you're expecting, but it's a true team effort. And I think when you look at Notre Dame and what they've been able to do, and you talk about the three-headed monster, but when we were in the press conference, they said, look, it's not three. We are six, seven players deep. So it's a seven-headed monster. So every single player at that time has to do, you know, do their job, play their role. And for Oregon State, they have done it as a team. It has been purely team effort and really being able to step up. I think at the end of the day, often first defense, who wants it more? I was extremely impressed. I, I was able to, to catch a full game of theirs against uh, USC and, and Watkins one of Watkins' quietest games of the season because of the way they were able to execute taking her out of her element in in a really impressive way. And so I expect more of the same in this game. I wanted to go back to the freshman thing that you mentioned, though, because obviously that's been a big story this season, and and Hidalgo being an example, Juju being an example. You won a championship as a freshman. What, What does it take to step up in those moments being a kid and having all this attention and pressure to be a key part of a of a championship team at that at that age, it takes great leadership, and great leadership starts with the coach. You know, I got the had the opportunity to play with arguably the best coach uh, ever, uh, and Pat Summit at University of Tennessee, and you know her leadership it, it carried down to our captain Shamiko Holdclaw. Kelly Jolly then, or yeah, Kelly Jolly then, Kelly Harper now, the head coach for Tennessee. And really when you go out there, the preparation, you know, when you get to the end of the season, all of the prep work and the, the team that you play, the, I mean, you brought up just how Oregon State was able to, in a way, contain Juju Watkins, right? All of the things that you've learned, the defensive system, offensively, what you've learned as a team, that comes into play as you get down the stretch. For So for us, I didn't really feel like the pressure. I felt like more of, I don't want to let my team down. And we play for the person on our left. We play for the person on our right. And every single day you get on the court, you have an opportunity to play basketball. I, coming from a person who would have felt a lot of pressure in that moment, I think that says a lot more about you than maybe you realize it does. But I I can appreciate the answer. And obviously you were around a, a really talented and, an experienced group and with with Pat and everybody else kind of I'm sure it it got more comfortable but you know that's still a, an impressive accomplishment but let's um let's jump to the the story that I think a lot of different folks are talking about with this with this tournament which is Caitlin Clark and and specifically with you what I was curious about is assuming things go according to way the way we expect she she will be joining the Indiana Fever in about 3 weeks Maybe a month, whatever you want to call it. And I'm, I, you know, firsthand, right? How great Indiana basketball fans can be, what that organization, what the, those fans mean to that organization and vice versa. And what, what the potential is when that thing is, is really clicking, having won championships there yourself and, and really built that fan base, I would say. 
What do you think it will mean for, for Caitlin to, to go there? And what kind of potential do you see for things to really click and, and for her to, to be embraced? Because there were a lot of people, right, when, when the, the, the lottery happened who were kind of wondering, is she going to want to go there? And there's been some struggles lately, but she seems enthusiastic about it. The fact that she's going into the draft would indicate that. H- how do you feel as, as we enter that era for the fever? I'm excited. And if I'm Caitlin Clark, I am extremely excited as well. You know, I think when, I mean, you just said it, the fan cheer and, you know, I will be honest, when I got drafted to Indiana, I knew nothing about Indiana as far as the fever and just the city. And now that I'm here, I still live here. I'm actually in the gym in Indiana because that's what we do, basketball year round. Uh, but the fans here are amazing. And that's one of the reasons that I am still here. The fever, the organization overall, and, you know, our ownership with the Simons has been, I mean, hand down one of the best. You know, we have the longest standing NBA owners, you know, also obviously owns the WNBA team and our G League team and, you know, our, our e-gaming team. So he's got his hands in a lot. But just how involved and engaged he is, he is with the organization says a lot, you know, from top to bottom. Everybody is excited about the opportunity with the fever extremely excited about welcoming Caitlin. And I think also Iowa is not far. So fans will travel wherever she goes. But I think the fact that it's not that far away from Iowa, we will see a lot of Iowa fans last year. And obviously we drafted a player from IU. All her fans were here. But let's not forget, you are not coming to save the organization. You have Aaliyah Boston, who was the number one pick last year, uh, AKA rookie of the year this year for the WNBA and player of the year in the NCAA. I mean, her, her accomplishments speak for themselves. You got Melissa Smith, who we got the previous year, another up and coming star. So you're coming into a team that has established players. When you look at a Kelsey Mitchell, you know, Erica Wheeler as a point guard, like we have players that are here, but then you add in kind of this new wave and it's really an opportunity, I think, for her. Right now, there is not really a, I I don't want to say face of the team. I really want to talk about there's not really that staple player that everybody like locking into. And I think that that could be her. Yeah, but, you know, like to to your point, uh, on court wise, this, this is not a typical number one draft pick type of team the way we would think of it in most sports where you're going to have a difficult couple of years and you know that that's a little different in the W anyway given how many older rookies there tend to be but with Aaliyah with Melissa Christy Sides I think did a did a great job in in year one over there and even you know the the backup you you mentioned Grace Berger and and other players like that even I I think are kind of ready to go so I'm very excited I uh and can we just I can't say, wait to see. It's it's always good to have another team that's that's at the top, and I think yeah. this will just make another one. And can we just say, I mean, you just – Lexi Hall from Stanford, you know, shooter. Um, yeah. Katie Lou Samuelson, they just signed another shooter. I mean, yep. you have – they're building a team. And, of course, I mean, training camp is coming up, right? So you're going to have an uh, influx of players that will come in, everybody having trying to go for an opportunity to make this team. I really feel like we're turning that corner. When you look at most championship teams, you know, you look at Seattle, you look at Phoenix, you look at LA, those teams were built on being able to have those number one pick come in. And we didn't have that until Aaliyah Boston. She was our first number one draft pick. And so now I really think you're, you're going to start seeing a shift for the Indiana Fever. So one of the things I've always been struck by looking back at at your career playing was obviously, you know, the accolades speak for themselves, mm-hmm. four-time defensive player of the year and championship player and we just mentioned what you were able to do with that fever group, but you were taking threes, you were defending with versatility and different matchups that is really reminiscent of what we see a lot today and what the chatter is around how basketball is is changing. And and to think that that was happening as far back as, you know, the the, the peak years of, of watching Tamika Catchings is, is kind of funny to me. 
So I wanted to get your perspective on this idea of, you know, obviously last year, the finals are Vegas and New York. Those teams did spread it out. You know, they have John Quell Jones, they have Asia Wilson mm-hmm. as far as interior dominating players, but they did space, they did play quickly, they they shot a lot of threes and a lot of the things we think of, but Do you think we will see more of that? Do you feel like somebody like Caitlin will accelerate that change? Or do you think we still have an Aaliyah Boston? We still have some of these great post players and it might kind of even itself out. I don't know what your perspective is, but I think it could go either way. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. Um, I feel like there's room for both. You know, Aaliyah Boston can post up down low. She can hit the mid-range shot, and she can knock down threes. You look at, you know, Asia Wilson, same thing, you know. Um, You look down the line at what happened down low. I think what what changing is just versatility overall, just being able to be a versatile player that can play multiple positions. So Leah can play the four or the five. You know, when I started playing, I was a post player in college, and then my last couple years – Pat was like, I need to move you, start transitioning you to more of a wing player. So when I got to the Fever, you know, I was a wing player. And then toward the end of my career, went back to being more of like a point forward. I think that's what you're going to start seeing, just the transition of, and and I don't even know if it's transition. I think that's the way the game is going, the versatility of players being able to play multiple positions, you know, one through five, you're switching on the defensive end. Um, that's where I think. And then shooters, of course, Caitlin Clark being able to pull out and shoot. Every single player, you know, when I look at some of these teams that are still around in the Sweet 16, you're looking at three, four players on the floor that are known for three-point shooting. And I think that's what's going to become vital. That's something that the Fever have missed, is being able, okay, I'm passing the ball. When Kelsey passes the ball, being able to have knockdown shooters on your left and right. Iowa, they have that. Kaylin Clark knows, obviously, everybody's targeting her, but when she passes to the left and she passes to the right, she got shooters out there, so who are you helping off of? And that what it's scary to think about if you can build your NBA or your WNBA team with more versatile scores on the side, I think that's the shift you start to see. All right, I have one final question for you, and I appreciate your time. Um, it's, it is a bigger one, so uh, you know, forgive me, but... <laughs> Um, no, just, uh, you know, I, I, I was kind of thinking about, about your career, like I said, and knowing I was going to be speaking with you, wanted to hit on the tournament, but I didn't want to lose the chance to, to touch on some of the other stuff as well. And it struck me that this TV rights deal for the WNBA that is about to be negotiated in the coming years will be the first one since you retired as a player and the first one <laughs> since you were intimately involved at, at some of the, the leadership levels of of the league and the next cba it'll be the second one obviously negotiated since neca has taken over as as union president so when you think of the opportunities within those those new talks and those new agreements that the league and its players will be coming to what do you take pride in about the doors you were able to open for some of those things to happen. It, it's been a bit, but at the same time, obviously that, that, that line is, is there between what you were able to, to do and the successes you were able to have in that leadership role. And obviously now what the players are, are getting rewarded with. Yeah, I'm really excited. I mean, I'm really excited just how women basketball has taken off. And, you know, look, my last year was 2016. NECA stepped in as president in 2016. My last year, it's kind of like we did the crossover because I was like, look, you're going to be the next one. We need to start making this transition yeah. so that you're, I'm around to help. But this is yours. And to see what she's been able to do, you know, I think between the social media that has just come, come up the last, you know, seven, eight years, I feel like it's really it really excelled. Players are learning how to utilize that, you know, as, as a team, we're learning how to use it. And individually for players, they're learning how to capital use it and capitalize off of it. I think it's the same thing for the W, you know, with Kathy Engelbert at, at the helm, she's done a great job of listening to the players, 
you know, and I know at times those, those highs and lows, right? You don't get everything that you want, but I think just the transition and being able to the last CBA really looking at more specific female, like, women's rights and things that we need that are different. Like we are not a cookie cutter league to what the NBA has. We don't have the same need that the guys have. They're different. And so really being able to look at that last, you know, last CBA was the first time, you know, the average WNBA salary was six figures. That's, that's a jump from where we were. And now obviously some of the numbers are skewed with just who's making what, but that's definitely an upward trajectory. Being able to add the travel, you know, during during the playoffs this past season, that's a jump. So we're getting to, you know, the players are getting to where they need to be. And I think with this new right, you know, being able to have the TV right, being able to kind of have more say on what is going on. You know, we for so long have had to struggle with, okay, like how much airtime are the, the women getting compared to the men and that whole struggle. But now we are to a point, and I think, you know, a big reason is you look at the stars that are coming out. Caitlin Clark right now is it. She's broken almost, I, I believe, almost every record. There might be one out there that she hasn't. Who knows what that is? Um, but she's broken all these records this year, and people are, 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 are gunning at it. They're looking at it. You know, everywhere I go in Indiana, everywhere, People are asking of men, women, boys, girls, like it does not matter. They are asking about her. And so the the attention that she has brought to this game, and I think even going into the WNBA, you know, one of the great things about majority of our players is that they go to college and then from college they come to the WNBA. So those fans will travel to see their players. And I think that's been great to watch or travel or they'll watch them on TV. So I really feel like with this new TV deal, it's going to be great for our league. You know, the women deserve it. Um, we at the WNBA and, you know, for me, I'm proud just to be a part of the front end. Like we're the trailblazers of what happened in the past. And now it's kind of NECA taking it to the next level. When she's finished and ready to retire, she'll pass the baton on to whoever's next. And so it's really exciting to watch all of the changes that are being made. Um, and I'm just really proud of, of our ladies and NECA's leadership. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate the wide ranging discussion and your, uh, your willingness to jump around. I, I did warn you, but I appreciate 